fingers crossed. Yeah, so I think this is the longest our fill wall has ever been on the screen. So you've all had a chance to, uh, to have a good laugh. Um, but it's important. It's important to record mistakes, things, things that could have gone better, and to uh, not be ashamed of them. But celebrate what you learned, not what, that you made a mistake. So, before we start, I'd like to ask you about these two sculptures. Which one of these is Greek and which one of these is Roman? Roman, Roman Greek. So, how, how can you tell? Looks like Roman. <laughs> Last time I asked this, I actually had a guy in the audience yell, the right one is Greek, and I asked, how do you know? And he says, I'm Greek. <laughs> So yeah, you can uh, uh, you can tell uh, you can tell, and uh, but they still they still look alike a little bit. You have you can see where the Romans got their inspiration. Um, historians used to believe that the Romans they kind of had a little bit of an inferiority complex of an imposter syndrome kind of thing compared to the Greek because they took so much of Greek culture. But later historians started to revise that a little bit, and. Um, they kind of more described to the Romans that they just took what was useful to them. The Romans were very much about usefulness. So they, they just observed from around them and, and from their own mistakes and they tried to copy that and then they tried to make it better. And they, they had a term for that that was called observatio, imitatio, emulatio. So that's where emulators come from. So. Um, I would like to give you some observatio because we've uh, we've done uh, a lot of projects, a lot of work uh, over the past few years, and uh, we've had some really mistakey experiences, uh, stuff that we learned from, and I hope to share some of that with you today. So my name is Pim. I work at Procurios, and uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter or if you want to know more about Procurios, you can uh, go there. Um, but first, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do and why we made so much, so many mistakes. So we work for um, we work for for, for customers, uh, uh, project work. So we we don't we have a product of our own that we use as as a base, uh, and then we do project work uh, to make sure everything is up to snuff for every customer, and to add features that they maybe need from us. And a couple of years ago. I think it was one of the last projects that we did that was not Scrum. Um, we had a very interesting feature. It was a really big project. They asked for more than 250 features. And uh, it was a weeks, weeks long project. And one of the features they asked us for was waterschappen. Do you know what a waterschap is? I know there's a, who doesn't know what a waterschap is? Okay. Yeah, it's it's a Dutch thing. You see, uh, you, you're probably familiar with uh, governmental hierarchies in the sense of a municipality and then uh, a province or a state and then uh, a federal government. Well, you may have noticed we have a lot of water. So besides that structure, we also have a separate governmental structure to manage water. And there are actually elections for that. And so to some of our customers, it's interesting to figure out in what waterschap watership people live? Now that's a really cool question and I am assuming not many people get that question because it was something we had to make ourselves. So we used all kinds of cool triangulations with lat length coordinates and, and polygons of, of waterschap and it took two weeks and it was really cool and was done and then we asked them uh, half a year later so how's that waterschap working out for you? Is it, is it good? Is it great? And they said what? What feature? They forgot. They had no idea they had that. They had no idea. Whoops. That was two weeks of work. Whoops. So we asked, yeah, oh, clients, oh, they're the worst. So we asked them, like, uh, why, why did you ask us to do this? And they're like, well, I think that one guy who doesn't work here anymore, he asked us at one point. We had, you know, they had a meeting and they tossed features around and this ended up on the backlog. What to do, what to do. 
So yeah, we, uh, we had to learn from this because we want our customers to make money because if they make money, then they buy more sprints. So we had to figure out what can we do about this. And we decided uh, we were done with uh, the projects this style. We wanted to take ownership. We wanted to take ownership, not just for what we built and how we build it, but for the outcome, for the outcome of our projects how our projects landed and how they would function after time. And so uh, we decided to, uh, out of all the, the, the things that you can do with, with Scrum and everything, we decided to really focus on the user stories. Now this is a requirement. <coughs> Has anyone uh, got requirements like this? Uh, we want to have that. Yeah. So one thing we uh, we did uh, um, after the whole uh, waterschappen debacle, one particular group of customers we focused very much on was fundraising. And fundraising has a lot to do with donations and gifts. And so we have many customers who do something with donations and this was one of the requirements that we got. The user must be able to export donations. What do we think about this requirement? Is this something we can work on? Is this something we can do to make this requirement better? Can we make this requirement more useful? <coughs> Any ideas? Well, I yeah. The user story format, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with it, but ta-da, there it is. Oh, damn it. Uh, <laughs> The user story format requires two more ingredients, a why, very good, and for who. So we decided to add a for who. And we decided to add a mark, the marketing manager, who is a persona. Are you familiar with the term persona? So a persona is a real like, but not real person that is interesting for us that has a, a certain connection to the project that we're doing and that has a stake. Now Mark the marketing manager is apparently the person who asked us to export donations. Now why would Mark want to do that? Apparently Mark wants to send a mailing containing some of that information. Good question. Is this something we can work off of? Hmm? Or can we do better? Yeah, so what? Send the email ready without exporting. Yeah, so we should probably ask him why do you need this information if you want to send a mailing? So we asked Mark, and Mark tells us, well, you know, I need this information because I want to send this mailing to customers who donated a lot. So I don't know if uh, uh, any of you uh, have these export requirements that you get every now and then. Excel is the bane of developers' existence. <laughs> every time they ask us to get an export that they can use in Excel, it means there's something they're not telling us. <laughs> <laughs> it's not your first time you hear about Excel, I hear. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, today actually. Oh. Today. Well, I, I, what was it? Uh. Uh, floats and language settings. Floats, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, LibreOffice actually allows you to uh, configure a lot of that, but Excel takes the, the, the settings of the machine and uh, drama, drama. So yeah, what should we, what should we ask Mark? <coughs> okay. You want to send a mailing to customers who donated a lot? What's a lot? What's a lot? Well, that's something you could ask. But that's not a project defining question. Yeah, you can still argue about that the moment you're typing it in. You can, uh, uh, a dollar sign a lot is, hey Mark, what's a lot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we need to go deeper. I think we need to ask Mark more. So let's see what else we could ask Mark. So if we ask Mark again, why? Why do you want to uh, uh, send us mailing? Well, Mark apparently wants to tell customers that donated a lot how we use their gift to improve the world. 
because apparently these people want to know they made a difference. Uh, is there anyone here who uh, who donates to charity? Uh, uh, for, uh, you ever get an email after you donate it? Yeah, if, yeah. I, if I can give them more money. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <coughs> apparently, apparently, once you realize that you made a difference, <laughs> Okay. That makes you want to give more. So we're starting to get a feeling about what Mark is about. Money. Marketing guys. Yeah. Yeah, he is responsible for uh, for sending money, of course, for getting money, of course. But he needs to convince you. So what else? What is this? Is this? Is are we done? Do we know what to do now? <laughs> but one, one thing that interesting that happened here is we stopped talking about software. There's no software in here. There's just people and interaction. No software. But there's still something fishy about this and that is that Mark is burdened with this task but the benefit is not for Mark. And a good user story does not have a mismatch between who is burdened and who benefits. So what we have here is we're missing a persona. Ta-da! <laughs> Meet Claire, the big spender customer. <laughs> so as Claire, the big spender customer, I want to know how my gift held, this is just, I, I just googled Claire, the big spender, and that's what came up, I'm sorry. Uh, so as Claire, the big spender customer, I want to know how my gift helped improve the world so I know I made a difference. So now there is no more mismatch. We're not talking about software, but we're also not talking about money. Once your user stories start to be about money, you've gone too far. Because all of this is about money. All we do is about money. So when we're still talking about software, we need to go further. But when we hit the point where we talk about money, we've gone too far. And right between there, that's the sweet spot of a good user story. At least once you have no more mismatch. What are we thinking? Is this a good user story? Can we work with this? Well, something interesting happened. See, usually people come to us and they ask us, hey, can you make this feature? And then we say, but why and why and why? And we, okay, well, well. well, this feature apparently implements this solution, this solution to this problem that people have. And I bet most of you already do this. Because once you understand the problem, you can explore different solutions and different ways of implementing those solutions. And I bet most of you do this, albeit maybe not explicitly so, but you get ideas. Someone tells you, uh, hey, can you make an export for those donations? Oh, we could also send a, a mail every now and then, or I could also... Uh, hmm? But once you realize that this one that we actually talked about costs maybe only two story points to create, but it does cost Mark a couple of hours a week to operate. Mark has to make those exports, he has to send those mailings. But we can also offer an alternative solutions where we automate it, where we send an automated mailing. And it takes more time to create. But Mark is no longer burdened. And Mark can do other stuff. So this is what we started doing. And this was really good for us for a while. It worked for many customers. but not for all customers. So this is, uh, this is a backlog that we, uh, this, this is an actual backlog uh, that we created at one point. Uh, it's in Dutch because most of our customers are Dutch. Um, and so we, we truly did this whole as person, I want stuff because reasons. But we found that it was really difficult to make choices. We weren't helping our customers our customers, our clients, 
to make choices between those different kinds of solutions. We would go into a sprint with user stories on the backlog. And user stories still require a choice to be made. Are we going to do this properly or are we going to do this creatively? <laughs> <laughs> So what we ended up, uh, this is a really famous picture, we ended up doing this all the time. We did uh, two or three user stories really, really well, and then we were out of time and had problems, and we asked our customers, is this important, is that important? We asked them to prioritize the backlog. They didn't know how to make those choices. Up front, they thought it was a good idea, they thought this, this order was good, and in retrospect, many of our sprints weren't so good. And it's still way better than the Modwaterschappe stuff that we had before. Way better. But not good enough. What we needed was a way to make both the problems and the solutions visible, explicit, in, in, in your face. <coughs> and so we explored a different technique called story mapping. Has anyone ever done story mapping? Huh, two people. Cool, so this is new to you, that's really good. Okay, so story mapping kind of expands on the idea that we have here before. What story mapping does is we have um, no longer a one-dimensional backlog. We actually have a three-dimensional backlog. In blue, we talk about our products or epics or very high level stuff. Process maybe. And in the yellow cards we talk about steps that people have to take in order to get to where they need to go. You could, at every yellow card, if you click through you would see a user story. The yellow cards are for user stories. And then with the white cards below we put down features. Actual features that we could make. And for every release that we do, or for every sprint that we do, we select some of the features, and especially do not select all the others. <laughs> and that's when interesting stuff starts to happen for your clients, because they see what they don't get, that sprint. And that will usually trigger something, and then they'll, no, no, I want, I want this, but then you can't have that. Okay, but I want that, and then you can't have that. Oh. They have to make choices beforehand, not during the sprint. So how is that different from the practice before? So before, we would enter a sprint with user stories. Mm -hmm. And so they would make those choices, those very difficult choices about which solution we would actually create during the sprint. And so what started happening for us is our, um, uh, we have this uh, 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 to do doing done and then uh, accept it. And our story started bouncing between done and doing, done and doing. Is it good? No, it's not accepted yet. Okay, so what if we do it like this? No, not accepted yet. So our customers had all kinds of reasons to reject our stories, bar technical ones. And we only want technical reasons to reject our stories. Well, there's still a bug in here. Well, this isn't perfect just yet, you know, on the way we agreed upon. But once customers have the option to reject stories or tasks or features based on um, functional reasons, then your philosophy is going down the drain. You can't predict anything anymore. And so that's why in our practical case, what started happening was we would do one or two stories really, really well because they would bounce around the first four days and then we'd have one more day for all the other stories. <coughs> and so this, this story mapping approach made explicit which features we would enter a sprint with. And it helped our customers to choose because that's what is very important to get on early in the process, those, those difficult choices. Questions? So this is an actual story map from a really big project that we, uh, uh, that we did. This is the, the first project we did using story mapping. You can see there's still some getting used to on how many story points we can do per sprint, but we started averaging out about 25 points per sprint. 
this was a, an, um, this was supposed to be an 11 sprint project and by sprint 4 we could inform our customer that we weren't going to make it and they could make some more difficult choices and by sprint 9 we were done and we could add more features. So the very first project that we did with, with this technique was really good for us but it was a very big project. And even with story mapping, which we still do, we found some, <clears throat> some stuff that wasn't working for us. So story mapping, as compared to our previous approach, requires us to make choices early. And for a lot of people, that's actually really difficult. In fact, it's for many programmers really difficult. I'm someone who makes choices really poorly. I'm great with, with all these user stories and exploration and options. I'm great at, at, at coming up with features. But I'm horrible at, at advising on, on choices. So, this is actually kind of where we are now. We are not sure how we're going to solve it, but we have some ideas. And at least we have some ideas on where things are not going so well. This is from, uh, from graphic design. Has anyone seen the double diamond approach before? So the double diamond approach, at least as an idea, is really cool because it allows people who are divergent and people who are convergent to shine explicitly. So if I tell you a really good idea. A really good idea. Is the first thing that comes up for you is, oh yeah, but if you say that, then we could also do this. Or is the first thing that comes up for you is, oh, but have you thought about this? Or have you thought about this? Uh, both options. Both options. <laughs> You're a liar. <laughs> ah, horrible people. Almost everyone is slanted towards one or the other. Either they come up better with issues, beer op de weg, or they see options, chances. I myself am someone who is divergent, I'm better with, with chances. I'm someone who goes, eh, I'm done, and then someone else comes along and says, well, you missed this and you missed that. And fortunately, I have one team member who's really good with, you missed this and you missed that, and, and so he's very convergent. These words for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Which works for you as well. So what does this mean for us? Well, this means for us that story mapping, story mapping kind of misses, misses out on the first part. It's more of a, of a second part approach. So we are challenged to find more approaches to do for the first part. So we're trying, some, uh, we're trying out some of those techniques, um, something like value, uh, value mapping or impact mapping, or basically any approach that allows us to get a lot of post-its going very quickly without people going, well, this isn't good and we don't want that. And no, 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 just, just relax and just get some ideas going. But that's where we are now, and I'm not, go I'm not sure how it's going to work for us. So um, I'm probably going to update this presentation again in a year and <laughs> give it again uh, at, at certain places. So the way that we got where we are is we at least needed to, um, to realize what was going on for us and what we could do to do things better. So one thing that has been very key for us to keep doing almost religiously every sprint is retrospectives. Do you all do retrospectives? Uh, do, do, who, do, who doesn't know what a retrospective is? <laughs> Good. So retrospectives really allowed us to um, look back every sprint and be open and honest about what did and did not work for us so well or what worked for us, and what could have worked even better for us. And every retrospective, we do one 
Experiment max. One small controlled experiment. Someone randomly pick. Someone of our team picks something they want to fix. And then in the same double diamond approach, we come up with possible things we could do to fix that specific problem. And we pick one of those. And that will become our next experiment. And we put it on the wall. And uh, we gave it uh, every, every week that we give it an honest chance, we give it a, a check. And every week we don't give it an honest chance, we give it a cross. And once it's gained three checks, we evaluate with the team if there's anyone who doesn't want to make that experiment permanent. And so you see, this is a picture I took this morning. We currently have three experiments going and uh, nine still worth mentioning that we accepted and a couple that we didn't accept. They're in Dutch, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, for example, one thing we, um, we didn't used to do before and that we still have a lot of problems with is making burn down charts because still some predictability issues during our sprints. But stuff we, uh, we accepted in the past was to uh, only accept everything using merge requests. No, no more code merged without merge requests. So what do you, what do, you do? What do you do if someone objects to it? So, so if they, they say like, oh, like four people are really enthusiastic about an idea that gets three checks, mm -hmm. one person is like, no, I got a, I wrote, I've got a real problem with this. Yeah. So that happens, and um, well, we we like we like to think we're a really healthy team. So if if there is someone who truly objects, then we don't do it. But we what we what we do is um, is this a a hundred percent issue? So um, most of the experiments on here are are not my idea. Mm, I don't care about half of them, but my team does, and I care about my team. So most of these are 30 to 50% issues for me. But one of my coworkers came up with the idea to um, plan one of our meetings according to how we predict or think about our client is going to be. And, 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 and that just doesn't sit right. I, I, I can't manage that. Um, well, one, th one time we'll do this and the other time we'll do that. I, I can't manage that shit. So that was a 100% issue for me. I didn't want that. And then the team is like, okay, well, you've been nice. You let all the other stuff go. So fine, we'll, we'll not do this. Other questions? How deep do you go with uh, the feature itself? So how to describe the feature itself? It depends. Uh, sorry. Um, well, we try to put it in enough detail so that we can't argue about whether we did that or not. And usually the estimate that we put on it is an indication of whether we've succeeded. If we have more than five story points in a feature, that's a big indication that it's, it's too big. Right? So experiments, um, we really try to limit ourselves. That's why we only do one experiment. Uh, that's why we only add one experiment per week max. So we never end up with too many experiments going on at once because we need to incorporate them. And once they become part of how we are, then we can take them off the wall and they'll, they'll drop from the checklist and we, we won't have to think about it anymore. And we'll have more mental, mental room for other experiments. So a thousand years from now, we're probably going to be remembered as savages as we look back thousands of years in, his, in, in history. But that doesn't mean we can't build things that last, even though software probably. <laughs> so that's why we, um, that's why we try and really take ownership, not just of the technical side of things, but the project side of things. We want to make sure that what we make is useful through the ages and not just during the sprints. Now a good talk leaves you with one message. 
So this is a bad talk because I'm going to try and leave you with two. <laughs> So take, take ownership of the outcome of the project. That's super important. It's not our work to code. Our work, our, our work is to change the world and coding is a way to, uh, to do that. And try a little bit better every time. Just a little bit. Thank you very much.